Welcome and thank you for coming to the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic, dry eye, the problem, the solutions, the future. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. The Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation to support research only, are only made possible because of philanthropic support. We use that uh, support to, to get some of the research started and some of it you're gonna hear about today that, uh, that is, again, advancing care for people with all of the conditions mentioned. Thank you all who have supported and thank you for your considerations in the future. This is a Zoom um, uh, platform that we're on. You recognize Zoom now, many of you do, but uh, this one is, I'm just gonna tell you some housekeeping here. Chat is disabled, so you won't be able to chat to your friends, but we will ask, we, we can do Q and A. So anytime during the program, if you have a question, you can go to the bubbles down the bottom of your screen or wherever they are on your screen and click on the Q&A function. When you click on Q&A, you can type your question and then our panelists will get to it at the end of the program. We'll ask you to refrain from um, personal health questions, but we will at one form or another try to get to uh, everybody's questions. You can also send questions via email to Mr. Craig Smith um, at any time. Please feel free to use um, the, the subtitle function for closed captioning if you should need so. And uh, we will be sending a survey to, um, in the coming days to tell us how we did and tell us what you thought of the program. And we use that to um, enhance other programs. Thank you for that. And then we'll also be adding you to our email list for future webinars. And I think you'll find more and more uh, webinars that you may be interested in, in the future. So I'm gonna introduce today's first speaker and uh, of, of the two, um, uh, Dr. Dependor Dollywall, Professor of Ophthalmology, Director of Cornea, Cataract, and External Disease Service, Director of Refractive Surgery Service, Medical Director of UPMC Laser Vision and Aesthetic Center, Director and Founder of the Center for Integrative Eye Care, and Associate Medical Director of the Charles T. Campbell, Campbell I'm sorry, Ocular Microbiology Laboratory. Dr. Dollywall, it's a pleasure to see you. Dr. Swami Nathan, thank you as well. Looking forward to hearing both of you today and uh, begin Sight and Sound Bites. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, all of you for joining us. I know this is a little bit of an odd format, but I love it. I love it because you can be in the comfort of your own space and um, get educated on some of the things that we're working on at the Eye and Ear Institute. So I wanted to thank Lonnie for that lovely introduction and really just a shout out to the Ioneer Foundation because they enable us to do clinical research, basic science research, and really enhance patient care. So let's get to it. We are so um, excited to bring to you this topic of dry eye disease. And I'm fortunate to be presenting with Dr. Swami Nathan, who, who you will hear from later on in the presentation. So we're gonna start with what is dry eye disease? Now, almost everybody you speak with has it. And it's true because it's extremely common. 15 to 30 million Americans suffer from ocular surface damage due to dry eye disease. And I have it. And again, many of you do too, but some of you may not realize it. It is the leading cause of visits to eye care professionals. And one super important thing to remember is that dry eye disease is treatable, but it's not curable. So I have so many patients that come to me and say, you know, you gave me these drops, we're doing this treatment, yada, yada, but I still have dry eye and you will always have dry eye. It's like kind of like arthritis. It's a chronic condition and we wanna do our best to enable you to function optimally but at the end of the day, you'll still have that background. 
To understand dry eye, we need to take a deeper dive into the tear film. Now, tears are extremely complex and really quite an amazing um, part of our ocular surface. So when you look at the tears, it's really kind of a complex structure, but we can break it down into three basic parts. And the first layer that coats the eye is actually a mucin layer, and that's made by goblet cells. And that helps our tears adhere to our eye. Then there's a middle layer, and that is an aqueous layer. And that really is kind of a, a bulk of the, the tear film, and that really nourishes and protects the cornea. And that's made by glands such as the lacrimal glands and accessory lacrimal glands. And then the final outer component is actually a lipid layer. So lipids are like oils, and they're made by very important glands along the eyelid called meibomian glands. And those glands secrete this lipid layer, this oily layer, and that lubricates and prevents evaporation. And it turns out that that meibomian gland dysfunction or a problem with those glands is really a huge part of dry eye. And um, the, the deficiency of a, the lacrimal glands or the aqueous part is actually, it does play a role, but not as big of a role as the lipid layer problem. Blinking is critically important. So if nothing else from this talk, if you could just remember the importance of blinking, um, it's absolutely critical because we, we are on electronic devices, we're not blinking enough. So we think of the 20-20-20 rule. If you take a break every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away, and then for just close your eyes and just pump your eyelids closed 20 times, that will refresh your eyes and make you feel better. So what are some symptoms of dry eye disease? Red irritated eyes with a burning sensation. That's very common. Sometimes people have a scratchy or gritty feeling. Another common thing is fluctuating vision. If you just have blurred vision, that's the same all the time. That could be cataract. That could be so many different things, macular degeneration, for example. However, if it's fluctuating vision, that often can be attributed to dry eye. Now, excessive tearing is, is an interesting symptom. And some people say, how could I have dry eye? I tear all the time. Well, there's different types of tears. A reflex tear, like when you're cutting onions or when, you're, you know, when your eyes are irritated, that's actually a reflex and that's not nourishing the ocular surface. So that excessive tearing is because your eyes are irritated from being so dry. Those tears don't really help you. So that could be a symptom of dry eye. If it's severe, you can have pain and light sensitivity, but remember, typically dry eye is not a you know, vision-threatening or life-threatening disease, but it does affect your lifestyle. What are some causes? Again, like I mentioned, electronic device use. This is huge. We are blinking less. So when you use an electronic device or you're reading, reading the newspaper, et cetera, you're blinking less. And when the lids are not covering the ocular surface, your tears are going to evaporate more. So think of the lids like little windshield wipers, right? You have to make sure you, you um, cover that ocular surface to get the best uh, results. Now, environmental factors really can be a key part, especially in the Pittsburgh winters. We have low humidity and we can get more dry eye. In the summer, we have these overhead fans or vents from the heating or air conditioning can really irritate uh, the ocular surface. In terms of lifestyle, smoking, secondhand smoke, very harmful to people's eyes. Increased age, another cause of dry eye. Women are affected more than men, contact lens wear, and certain medications such as antihistamines, they dry out the eye 150%. Antidepressants, diuretics, beta blockers, estrogen replacement therapy, all of these medications have been associated with dry eye. And then there's the medical conditions such as Sjogren's syndrome, thyroid disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and others that can be associated in a cause of dry eye. Glaucoma drops. So this is another thing, right? These glaucoma drops are wonderful because they help lower the eye pressure, but they can be very irritating and can contribute to ocular surface dryness. Now, treating dry eye disease is a very interesting um, concept. And while, before I go into these treatments, I, I want to share with you just a kind of a video of, of what 
the tear film looks like. So I'm gonna show you here uh, uh, just a schematic of what the blinking, what blinking should look like. So you have the tear film and then when the blink happens, the tears, they go out these two areas. These are called the puncta, the lower and upper puncta. And when we blink, this goes into the um, nasolacrimal duct and then out our, out our nose. So I'll show you that again. So this is the ideal situation. Tears are made and then our lid comes down and we blink and then the tears go out the nose. So that's a healthy ocular surface. But in dry eye, what we find is that there's just not enough tears for some reason, or maybe the lipids are problematic and the eye gets red and irritated. Now, what we have in the, these are the oil glands, the meibomian glands, and these are like little tubes of toothpaste, but really what should be coming out is like olive oil. That should be the consistency. And you can see when you have meibomian gland dysfunction, the, the oils, instead of being nice and clear, they're thick and clogged. And so you can imagine these glands should be secreting a beautiful kind of coating on our eyes, but these glands are blocked. The coating is not there. The tear, tear film is evaporating quickly and you can become symptomatic with burning. And these glands you can see are located just um, behind the lashes. So oftentimes when you come to the office, we'll express to see what's coming out and we can see the consistency of the oils. So now let's go back to the treatment, because now you'll understand um, what we were talking about in terms of it's just easier to understand the um, schematic. So it's not one size fits all. It's a really a customized approach in terms of treatment because we have to understand why you have dry eye. But here are some basic steps that really work for everybody. You wanna modify the environment, increase your humidity. So just get a cool mist humidifier decrease airflow, turn off the fans, um, especially overnight. Uh, when I'm driving, you know, when you're driving in the car, make sure the vents are not pointed directly at your face. There should be no moving air because that really dries out the eyes a lot. Artificial tears are wonderful. They're not exactly the same as our natural tears, but they can be a wonderful supplement. And we prefer the preservative free kind because then you don't have an extra issue with a preservative irritating the eyes. And really, if you have basic dry eye, you can start with the artificial tears one to four times a day, and that can help tremendously. Now, here's the critical thing, warm compresses. And now you understand those, you wanna melt the thick oil in the glands. And that's the idea of the warm compresses. You wanna help those meibomian glands secrete a nice thin oil. Now you can get a beaded mask, but now there's some electric masks that are really wonderful. You just plug them in and they heat up the eyelid to a, a nice temperature for, we want you to do 15 minutes. And I know that sounds like a long time, but 15 minutes twice a day is wonderful. That's a great way to start. And we ask our patients to think blink. And I have to remember this too. So remember the 20-20-20 rule, blink your eyes. When you actually blink forcefully, that's a stimulus for the little meibomian glands to secrete the oil into the tear foam. So that's actually helping the oil gland secrete. And if you don't ever blink, then the, the glands can become blocked and, and you know that story. Now, if you have blepharitis or you have some debris on the lids, we often ask you to use lid wipes and a tea tree oil wipe can be very helpful because that tea tree oil is a natural antiseptic. Other treatments, and then again, it depends on your particular eye, but then we go into prescription drops for dry eye. And we have some wonderful options available like Restasis, Zydra, Sequa, and even some um, mild steroids we use for, for dry eye. We also can use some punctal plugs. And you saw the little puncta where the tears exit. That's the area that we're plugging, not the formation of the tears, but the drainage of the tears. We also sometimes use gels, ointments, um, autologous serum drops. That's for severe dry eye, we, we actually can prepare some drops from your own blood. Um, and, and that has a lot of growth factors. The moisture goggles are super important, especially if you open your eyes at night while you're sleeping um, or you have severe dry eye that can help during the day. And then we have some in-office procedures that can be helpful or specialty contact lenses. 
And I'm so blessed and fortunate to work with a wonderful, um, wonderful colleagues that help in our uh, treatment of our patients with dry eye. And Dr. Vishal Janji is, is one of our wonderful uh, researchers and clinicians. And he's um, collaborated with Dr. Swami Nathan on some dry eye research. Dr. Alex Maman is another fantastic um, colleague as well as Dr. Rohina Kamyar and Dr. Gaurav Prakash. They are all wonderful. And we all have a very similar system in treating dry eye. We try to think of the best practice pattern and have basically kind of a, a protocol type of approach to successfully treat your dry eye. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shiva Swami Nathan, uh, who is a researcher. We're so fortunate to have him uh, in our department. He is a researcher and an associate professor um, of, in the School of Medicine, uh, who is really looking at the ocular surface to understand the basic functions of the ocular surface and how at a molecular level we can try to affect change and, and create even better dry eye treatment. So I now invite Dr. Swami Nathan to come and, and um, give you uh, kind of uh, an array of these different studies that we're working on um, for treatment of dry eye disease. So Dr. Swami Nathan, please take it away. Thank you very much for a fantastic introduction, Dr. Dhaliwal. That was really, really uh, uh, highlighting the uh, problems associated with uh, dry eye and uh, what sort of uh, symptoms are there and the treatments available. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so now uh, let me uh, uh, move into what sort of research is going on in uh, UPMC that is related to uh, the uh, dry eye disease. Now, the ocular surface or the front surface of the eye is a continuous surface that you know, uh, connects the uh, cornea, the clear part of the eye and the uh, conjunctiva, that is the white part of the eye and the eyelids and so on. Now, this ocular surface is bathed by the tear fluid and there are different components of the ocular surface that contribute to the tear film. For example, lacrimal glands produce the aqueous part, uh, meibomian glands produce the lipid or oil part, and the mucins are produced by the goblet cells in the conjunctiva. And these all come together to produce a healthy tear uh, film. Now, that shows us that it's absolutely critical to have each component of this ocular surface formed and be you know, functioning properly for our ocular surface health. And we are very interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms, molecular networks of different proteins that regulate how this ocular surface is formed and how it is maintained as we go through our daily day-to-day -day activities. Now, our research that is funded by the federal government through the National Institutes of Health has demonstrated that the transcription factors called KLF4 and KLF5 are absolutely critical for proper formation and function of the ocular surface. When these genes, KLF4 and KLF5, are either mutated or not functioning properly for whatever reason, there are defects all over the ocular surface that result in dry eye-like symptoms. And we are now studying the, you know, the properties of these transcription factors and their functions in greater detail. In a related project, we are studying a protein called SLURP1. Uh, that is a part of the, the tear fluid. This SLURP1 is produced by the corneal cells and secreted into the tear protein, a tear uh, fluid. And our research uh, has demonstrated, again, this is a research that is federally funded through the National Institutes of Health. And uh, this research demonstrated that SLURP1 is a protein that acts as an immunomodulator. That is, it can help suppress inflammation 
in a healthy ocular surface. And whenever there is a pro-inflammatory condition, you know, be it dry eye or uh, chronic uh, you know, uh, conditions or uh, acute infections, slurpone goes away, indicating to the system that there is a need for inflammation. We are uh, focused on studying this, uh, the properties and functions of slurp one. Uh, I'm uh, so proud to say that we are uh, one of the only la laboratory in the whole world studying this, uh, the, this protein. And so we have a particular advantage in understanding uh, this. Now, the uh, inflammation uh, of the uh, lacrimal glands is a very common uh, condition that is uh, uh, frequently associated with dry eye. Many different types of dry eye ultimately end up having uh, this effect of inflammation in the uh, lacrimal glands. And inflamed lacrimal glands produce less tears. And without enough tears, there are dry spots, which, you know, in other words, is dry eye. Very recently, uh, uh, FDA approved uh, the use of cyclosporine at 0.05% concentration to treat this inflammation of the lacrimal glands and consequently dry eye. Now, there is a school of thought that believes that the, the higher, a slightly higher concentration of cyclosporine may be more beneficial. And we are testing that, we are testing if 0.09% cyclosporine is more effective in combating inflammation and consequently more effective in treating dry eye. This project is supported by a pharmaceutical company and uh, the, the research is ongoing with new patients being recruited to study this. In another project uh, that's you know, uh, addressing a different part of the, uh, the uh, tear fluid, that is the mucins. Uh, now, Dr. Dhaliwal indicated that mucins are produced by goblet cells, spe highly specialized cells that are present in the white part of our eye, the conjunctiva. And these, the only function of these goblet cells is to produce and secrete mucins that help retain the tear fluid on our eyes. So they stabilize the tear fluid. Without mucins, what happens is the tear fluids just flow through and you know, fall off of our eyes. They won't stay there. So it's very important that we have goblet cells and the mucins that are produced by goblet cells. Mucins also help fight against some bacterial infections. And uh, what is important for our purpose today is to understand that goblet cells are affected in most types of dry eye. Whatever the cause is for, for your dry eye, ultimately it results in some effect on goblet cells that results in the lack of mucins, which in turn results in uh, exacerbation of dry eye conditions. Our research uh, with uh, Dr. Wells in pathology uh, department found that IP10P, a peptide, uh, promotes this goblet cell formation. And uh, this was a serendipitous discovery that we are testing further to see if IP10P, the peptide, can help you know, uh, more goblet cells to be formed in the conjunctiva in dry eye conditions. And so whether it is a useful therapeutic for treating dry eye. Now, finally, uh, one thing that is clear is you know, there are lots of drugs available to treat different uh, kinds of diseases all over the body, and so is the case for the eye, for the ocular surface. The problem with these drugs, whatever we want to put on the ocular surface, is that they are hardly retained because tear fluid is quickly washed away. Every time we blink, we are removing some, and so there is fresh tear replacing the old tear. With that, the drug that was you know, put on our eyes with uh, say eye drops is washed away within seconds. And that is a problem because drug delivery is not effective. So Dr. Shanks and his colleagues in our department, they have found a very clever way of, uh, uh, of addressing this problem. They identified a biologic anchor that binds the ocular surface cells 
And the, the idea is the other end of this anchor can be attached to the drugs. So with that, the anchor is attached to the cells on the ocular surface and the drugs are retained longer on the ocular surface. So if this, whether or, whether or not this biologic anchor is useful for ocular surface drug delivery is being tested by Dr. Shanks and uh, his colleagues in a project that is supported by NIH as well as Wig and Family Foundation. So these are just to give you a flavor of uh, different kinds of uh, research that's going on. And this is a teamwork and supported by many different sources of uh, funding, most prominently uh, the federal government and uh, now here, the INDR Foundation of Pittsburgh. We are so thankful for all the support that is provided uh, uh, by all the donors through the I INDR Foundation of Pittsburgh. And uh, there are lots of uh, core facilities and collaborators who, you know, that um, also facilitate with, uh, our work. So with that, uh, I have given you a flavor of uh, different kinds of research going on in our, in our uh, uh, department. And I uh, thank you for your attention. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dollywall and Dr. Swami Nathan. Uh, I'm Craig Smith. I'm a senior development associate with the Ioneer Foundation. I'm going to uh, help moderate the Q&A session now. So the question and answer session is open. So please submit your questions. We have a few already, so I'll get right to it. Uh, the first question we have is, with many vitamin supplements on the market and various fish and krill oils, what research with significant population sampling are shown to be effective? Are there any studies in progress? Shiva, would you like to start or do you want me to? You can take that. Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. And um, you know, it's, it's a really important kind of part of the, the tear film are the lipids and the oils. So the thought is by taking supplements, we can modify the mybum that's secreted. So we want to treat dry eye from the outside in and from the inside out. So by taking a supplement, you can kind of enhance um, the composition of your oil glands, right? So of the mybum. And so the thought is to take some type of omega-3 fatty acids. And there are studies that you can see kind of on both sides uh, where there's some strong evidence to suggest that the omega-3 fatty acids can help um, by, you know, when you take enough and the right kind and you have enough absorption, then you can actually optimize the type of mybum that's secreted. So there are other studies though that say, well, you know, they used olive oil as a control and they didn't find quite as much statistical significance. But bottom line is, you know, these supplements are, you know, generally pretty safe, right? It's like eating a lot of fish if, for, if you want the fish oil, or you can also do black currant seed oil if you are um, a vegetarian. And they, you know, some of my patients, they say that their dry eye is so much better if they take the supplement. So what we think about in terms of dry eye treatment, it's not just one magic bullet, right? Because of the different components of the tear film, you really need to do multiple things. And we joke with our patients that, you know, you have to do your homework in order to get the good grades, right? To get the good results. So part of the homework is a strategy where, you know, you may use an oral supplement, but also there would be topical therapy. There would be the warm compresses. There would be blinking exercises. And all of those things together form your kind of um, strategy for success. So, so thank you for that question. And, and I really do think that, that you know, supplements can have a role, but the bottom line is things work differently for different people. And so as long as it's not something that's gonna hurt you, you, know, you could try it and see if that makes a difference in your particular type of dry eye. If, if I may add to that, anything that uh, decreases inflammation is helpful. So some of these supplements have uh, you know, an effect on systemic inflammation, they lower it a little bit. And, and, and that would, in, 
indirectly uh, be uh, reflected in the ocular surface health and uh, dry eye is, uh, you, know, you, you feel a little better uh, with, with dry eye. Thank you for that. Um, so you talked a little bit about the causes of dry eyes or some of the causes that can make dry eyes worse, but can, can dry eyes be genetic? There are some conditions where you have some, you know, congenital problems with, with the ocular surface structures forming, um, but that is, that is, you know, very rare. So the typical classic dry eye is, you know, something we talked about all those factors that can, can contribute to the formation of dry eye. So the patients that I see, uh, none of them that I can think of really have, you know, kind of the genetic type of uh, basis, unless the genetics are causing some other autoimmune diseases, et cetera. Okay. We have a, a compliment and a question here. We have a, thank you for the very interesting talk. How do contact lenses for dry eyes work? Okay, thank you for that question. So this is, there's many different contact lenses out there. And the contact lens that I was specifically discussing in, in terms of treatment would be a patient who has severe dry eye and we have a special medically necessary contact lens called a scleral contact lens, S-C-L-E-R-A-L, -E scleral contact lens. What the sclera is basically the white part of the eye and the scleral contact lens, it fits on the white part of the eye and it's very large and it vaults over the cornea. So what you do is you actually fill the contact lens with fluid and then put it on the eye. And it actually is almost like your eyes are being bathed in fluid constantly. And, and that is a wonderful treatment for severe ocular surface disease. So we do employ that. So that's the type of contact lens uh, I was referring to. Okay. Uh, how do tree oil wipes help with dry eye? Or do tree oil wipes help with dry eye? So it was... Tea tree oil wipes. Tea so tree tea tree oil. oil, tea tree oil is a wonderful natural antiseptic. And what can what it does is that actually can kill certain microorganisms that we're colonized with that can kind of grow in abundance, such as demodex. Demodex is actually a mite that can kind of overgrow at the base of the lashes. And um, we see this very commonly. And it can be really irritating, cause itching, especially first thing in the morning, your eyelids just kind of feel itchy and irritated and it can cause a lot of redness as well. So the tea tree oil wipes, it's a wonderful natural antiseptic and they can, uh, you can buy them just over the counter. And what you can do is you just basically wipe right where the lashes grow, right at the base of the lashes and they can actually kill the bad actors on the eyelids. So they are extremely effective and really one of our pillars of treatment when we're treating uh, this type of blepharitis. I think the next question is pretty relevant to a lot of people now in the age of COVID and, and doing more things on computer, but do specific kinds of computer glasses help with dry eye at all? So another really good question. So I have found that the, you know, kind of the blue light blocking glasses can help decrease glare and any type of glasses help dry eye patients because it decreases the amount of air flow around the eye. So, you know, you kind of want a protective type of shield, if you will, in front of your eyes. And so when you wear glasses of any type, you know, you walk outside, the wind doesn't bother your eyes as much. You're kind of, again, protected behind a little bit of a shield. So I also find that, you know, if you're working on a computer, one critical thing, and here's another really good tip in terms of environmental modification. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking a little bit down at my laptop and that's helping my dry eye. If, because my eyelid is covering my eyeball. If I have my computer screen up here and I'm looking, you can see my eyes are open much more widely. That will make my eyes much more dry. So I sit a little bit higher and I look down to my computer screen and then my eyelid is protecting my ocular surface and my dry eye is much better. 
So again, there's another trick, a very easy tip that you can just make your chair higher, use a laptop or a computer that you're looking down in, as opposed to looking up. Definitely, you know, looking up is a horrible thing, but looking even straight ahead keeps the eyes open a little bit too much. Is uh, macular degeneration a factor in dry eye at all? So there's no connection at all with macular degeneration and dry eye. Two totally different parts of the eye. So the dry eye is the ocular surface and then macular degeneration is affecting the retina. Okay. Uh, if this is a question maybe for Dr. Swami Nathan. Have any studies shown that lipid lowering drugs can have an effect on dry eyes? Uh Lipid lowering drugs having an having an effect on dry eye, not uh, to my knowledge, um, but uh, you know, uh, it 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 is a good question. Definitely, uh, maybe Dr. Dhaliwal has an insight into that. Yeah, like the statins. I think they're talking about. You mm -hmm. know, statins can help a lot of different things, but I'm not I'm not familiar with any research. Just like uh, Shiva mentioned, Dr. Swaminathan, I I'm not familiar with any uh, research. But you know, there's so many different studies. Uh, we're just really understanding how these systemic medications can affect longevity and things like that. I'm you know talking about different uh, types of medications that we could take. Um, and they have different effects on the body when we study it long term. So, you know, we, not, not to our knowledge. Uh, since it is thought that omega-3 can possibly be good, has any research the negative effects of statins? Kind of piggybacking off of your question, your answer. Negative effect of? Yes. Of stat? Yes. Of omega-3s, did you say? Yep. Shiva, do you know of it? No, no, nothing to uh, you know, support that uh, uh, possibility. Uh, again, uh, omega-3 definitely is beneficial and uh, statins uh, or other uh, things that uh, uh, suppress, or, uh, suppress the lipid uh, uh, production in the body as such. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not very clear where the connection is or uh, how this lebomin gland function can be altered by uh, use of uh, these statins. Okay. Uh, we have another compliment and question combination here. We thank you so much for this patient education opportunity. It's helpful to me. And the questions are, what are the risks of plugs and can they be removed or reversed? And are there permanent methods for closing the drains? Yep. Great question. And so there's, again, different types of punctal plugs. The type that I have are, um, and I've actually had uh, three different types. Uh, one is a permanent plug that is removable. So it's, it's made of a silicone material and it just sits inside the punctum, but you can see a little white dot. So you know if it's there or not. And that is a more permanent type of plug and it stays in as long as it stays in. I mean, I had my punctal plug in for about five years before it started irritating me a little bit and then I had it removed. That's one type of plug that can be removed that's semi-permanent. There's another plug that is dissolvable and that can work you know, anywhere from you know, three, you know, six weeks to three months or so. And we put that all the way in the, the punctum. So you can't really remove it easily but you could flush it through if necessary, if you had overflow tearing. So that's a more temporary plug. It's made of collagen. So it is dissolvable. Uh, and then there are types that are permanent that kind of sit lower down that are harder to remove. So the question is a very good one that you would have to have a discussion with your ophthalmologist about this. Um, the other thing is, yes, we can definitely permanently cauterize the punctum. So I do that when, you, when a patient has severe dry eye, um, we, and we control the ocular surface inflammation first, always. Uh, then we can go ahead and we try the uh, semi-permanent plugs first, see if that works and helps. And if that works and helps, but the plugs keep on falling out, then we can permanently close the, the puncta with heat. I think you mentioned these previously, but maybe a little bit more detail. What part do the 
and I'll see if I pronounce this correctly, the demo day mites have with dry eye? So um, Demodex is a actually this microorganism and it is a mite, okay? And I know it's, it's it kind of, um, is, is challenging concept to think about, but you know, we're covered with bacteria, with microorganisms, right? And we understand that there needs to be a, a wonderful balance of bacteria in us, right? We all are now getting more aware of our microbiome in the gut and how important that is to, to our functioning. There it turns out there's an ocular microbiome as well. And Shiva can speak to that in terms of the importance. And we have uh, researchers who are looking at the ocular microbiome to understand the importance and what's there. And then there's some bad actors, okay? So they, these can be kind of an overgrowth or a colonization. And these, this is what I'm referring to the Demodex. They are actually, they, they live uh, right at the base of the eyelashes and kind of around um, the, the, the base of the eyelashes, they kind of form sleeves. And what happens is they, they can, um, by their just being there and living there and, and um, doing what they do, they can really irritate the ocular surface um, by living there. And so they can be a cause of severe inflammation along the eyelid margin. And so you have to have, you know, we have to look with a microscope, uh, which is called the slit lamp. We look at your eyelid, we'll have you look down and we can look right at the base of the lashes and we can see characteristic signs of the demodex. And when we see those, then we typically treat with tea tree oil wipes. And the other thing that's very effective is just to use any bland type of eye ointment that can just kind of, we ask you to do that at bedtime to put that ointment right at the base of the lashes and it actually suffocates the little mites. And, and that can be really, really helpful as well. Um, and Shiva, would you like to add anything about the, the Demodex or the, the microbiome, ocular microbiome? Yep, um, I, I think you covered the uh, Demodex part of it uh, uh, very well. Uh, the uh, microbiome as such, uh, there is uh, research going on in our own uh, department uh, in uh, Dr. Uh, St. Ledger's laboratory where uh, he's actually studying the beneficial aspects of uh, a uh, certain type of bacterium that is present in the ocular surface. Not every bacteria that you can imagine is harmful. There are some beneficial uh, types as well. So you know, there is no uh, known link between dry eye and uh, uh, these ocular microbiome, but I will not be surprised if one is detected in the uh, coming uh, years. And so you know, uh, stay tuned for that. And how does, uh, how does eye makeup affect dry eye? Well, these are really great questions. So, <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll tell you the, the one really bad offender in terms of eye makeup is mascara. Mascara can be really irritating to the ocular surface. And we see patients, and for all of us who wear mascara, we know, you know, you can put it on one day and you, you wipe it off. Um, but it doesn't always come off all the way because it's the kind of the thick tar type of substance. So it like kind of lives at the base of your eyelashes and it's really hard to remove and you never really get your eyes clean. So that can be super irritating to somebody who has pre-existing dry eye. So one thing that we ask when you come in, you have severe dry eye, we actually ask that you stop using all eye makeup and just stopping all eye makeup and cleaning the, the lids with a, like a tea tree oil wipe or just even a, uh, just a natural, you know, a, a different type of eye wipe that doesn't have to have tea tree oil, um, but there's different types that will just help you clean the, um, the base of the eyelashes very nicely. That can be really very helpful. And um, I will give a little shout out. There's one type of mascara that we find really is much easier to clean and to come off the lashes. And that's called Blink Mascara and it's B-L-I-N-C. And um, 
you, when you wear it, basically it forms like a little sleeve on each eyelash. And then you just take a, a washcloth and you kind of just wipe down at the, when you're washing your face at night and you'll see the little sleeves on the washcloth because it actually will come off. The mascara will come off fully. And that often helps our patients who have dry eye because they're able to get the mascara completely off the eye before you go to bed. I have no financial interest in blink mascara, but <laughs> I find that it doesn't irritate my eyes. So on the rare occasions I do wear mascara, I, I, I wear that one because at least I can get it all off at night. Well, there you go. Uh, doctor recommended. <laughs> well, I don't is, know, but yeah. Is, uh, is Avanova still recommended for eyelid bacteria and mites? Wow. Yes. So yes, Avanova. So what is Avanova? Avanova is a hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid is something that's found in our own cell that helps, you know, kill off uh, bad, you know, bacteria and things that we don't want. So it's a, it's a spray that we use and that I recommend when you have an overgrowth um, of these microorganisms. And we have done research in our labs uh, at the Ioneer um, to show that the Avanova can kill bacteria even in if it's in a biofilm. So, so it is definitely a, a component of, you know, kind of a dry eye or blepharitis regimen. Blepharitis is just inflammation of the eyelid. And I use dry eye and blepharitis. It's often together. You, you typically don't just have one or the other. Um, it's kind of an umbrella. Dry eye is kind of an umbrella term and, and blepharitis is definitely in there and, and, you know, a very common uh, co-conspirator. So bleph, anything when we say bleph refers to eyelid. And so itis is inflammation. So blepharitis, inflammation of the eyelid, that's all it is. Um, so Avanova, if you have blepharitis, we will use, ask you to use uh, Avanova to decrease. It's another natural antiseptic, similar to tea tree oil uh, that we use in our regimen, again, depending on your typical uh, type of dry eye. Well, speaking of blepharitis, uh, next question is, can a person with astigmatism and blepharitis wear sclera contacts? Yes, absolutely. If you have, uh, you know, the scleral contacts are wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful devices. Uh, they help a lot of different types of, of patients and they can be used um, they can treat severe forms of astigmatism. So our like severest astigmatism patients uh, can be helped with scleral contact lenses. And honestly, um, it once you wear a scleral contact lens, your eyeball, the eye, the cornea is protected from the eyelid. So it doesn't matter how much inflammation you have on the eyelid. When you're wearing the scleral contact lens, your cornea is beautifully protected. Okay. Next question is, uh, would you explain the role of rosacea as a factor in dry eye? And if so, what remedies might exist? So rosacea is another very common co-conspirator. And we talk about rosacea, you know, in the face where you have a kind of a ruddy complexion where the eyelids, either the blood vessels are a little bit dilated and there's some inflammation we often see ocular rosacea. Ocular rosacea is basically where the blood vessels along the eyelid are dilated. They're, you know, your eyelids are inflamed again. So ocular rosacea and blepharitis you know, are basically a very similar type of concept. So you have inflammation along the eyelids. So ocular rosacea is a very common, again, condition that we, we see and we treat um, with very similar types of remedies. Uh, you know, and if you have uh, facial rosacea and you're taking medicine for that, that can often help uh, your ocular rosacea as well if it's, a, if it's in the form of a pain. So the next question is, if, if I have an appointment for a cataract evaluation, is the exam comprehensive such that issues like dry eye or blepharitis is included in the evaluation? Well, typically, yes. You know, and again, it depends on, um, 
I, I would say the, the short answer is typically yes, but if you don't look, you don't see it. So make, you know, you have to be looking for these things. You have to look for the demodex. And really, if you just look down and, and you scan the base of the eyelashes, you'll see uh, what's going on there. So, um, and, and that being said, let me just say something. I, I often compare blepharitis to dandruff, right? I mean, like, you know, a lot of us have dandruff, right? It's not a big deal. It's not going to kill you. So a lot of us have blepharitis, right? I, I admitted I have dry eye and yeah, I have a little bit of blepharitis too, right? I have, you know, the meibomian gland disease is a type of blepharitis. Okay. So I definitely have that. Now we don't, unless we're symptomatic, we don't always, you know, treat dandruff in the same way, unless you're symptomatic, you don't have to treat every degree of blepharitis there is, right? Just like we don't take out every cataract that we see because there's degrees of cataract and the, there's the amount of, of difficulty functioning, you know, depends on your degree of cataract and that would help us with our decision-making. So just the absolute diagnosis of blepharitis doesn't mean you need this whole regimen and, you know, tea tree oil. you don't need all that necessarily. You have to have a conversation with your eye care professional. And the wonderful thing is, you know, we have, um, you know, optometrists, ophthalmologists, uh, all of us can treat dry eye and blepharitis very effectively. So I guess kind of going hand in hand with having an appointment with your ophthalmologist is how do you identify a demodex infection? Wow, this demodex thing is really popular. I guess it's good. It's a really concerning a lot of people. Don't worry. Okay. Even if you have it, it's okay. You'll be all right. Uh, it's just like dandruff. So um, you just look, okay, you could just look, you can see the little sleeves on the individual lashes and you see some debris. That's how you diagnose, you can see Demodex. If you really wanna be a purist, um, and we do this sometimes because we're at the UPMC Eye Center and we have a wonderful microbiology lab laboratory, we sometimes pluck a lash and then we take it down to the lab and you can look at under the microscope and you can see the little Demodex under a microscope. So under a much higher power microscope than we use for the slit lamp, uh, our, our ocular microbiologist can look at the lash and the base of the lash and you can see the actual demodex um, in that microscope. So uh, you can be a purist and look at it that way, or you just look, you know, the clinical signs are, are very classic. And the good news, I wanna share with you all some great news. There is a company um, that is now making a wonderful treatment for Demodex. So stay tuned, as Shiva said, stay tuned because the future is bright for the treatment of Demodex blepharitis. And there will be a, a actual, you know, um, type of therapy that we can do that will be targeted to kill Demodex. And I, and I can't wait for that to be um, FDA approved because I think it's going to really change the lives of so many pe uh, people because we'll be able to effectively, um, you know, kill the organism with with the kind of that may be the magic bullet for demodex blepharitis. So I, I think you kind of gave the answer to this, but uh, it, maybe you can expand upon it. Is is dry eye related to age? Shiva, go ahead. You, you <laughs> I see you now. Yes, of course. Yes, yes, of course. You know, it is uh, associated with advanced age, and uh, uh, it's very common uh, uh, once we uh, go over fifty years of age, and especially so in women uh, in uh, perimenopausal uh, women, it, it's much more frequent. Okay, thank you. Uh, how expensive are scleral contacts? I don't know. I don't know because I haven't had to uh, get any, but you know, again, um, there are some types that are medically necessary, so they may be covered by insurance. So I would recommend um, working with uh, an optometrist who fits scleral contact lenses and then having that discussion, because again, there's several different types of scleral contact lenses. So that's, that's a, a challenging question to answer. Uh, we're going back to the Demodex again. Is it okay to use 
cilantro cream on eyelids to kill Demodex? I don't have any experience with that. Okay, and then maybe our last question for the day is what about autoimmune diseases and the connection to dry eye? Yeah, uh, def there is definite uh, link, uh, you know, with, with uh, autoimmune disorders and uh, dry eye. Uh, essentially, because of the associated inflammation, you know, uh, we the moment we think of uh, dry eye and autoimmune disorders, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Sjogren's uh, you know, syndrome, uh, which uh, comes with associated uh, dry mouth uh, and dry eyes. So both salivary glands and lacrimal glands are inflamed and uh, that is what uh, causes the symptoms. And other than the uh, uh, symptoms associated with uh, Sjogren's, um, you have dry eye disease uh, frequency higher in uh, patients suffering from rheumatoid arthritis or uh, lupus. So it's fairly good association because of the high degree of inflammation that these patients suffer. Good question. Yeah, it's a, it's a very well well established link there. Good. We'll, uh, we'll end here with just uh, another compliment we got. It says, uh, I have learned so much relevant information from the, Dr. Dollywall's Q&A and presentation. She's very gifted at explaining and teaching. I also appreciate the research explanations from Dr. Swami Nathan. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, we again, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We're just about out of time here. Uh, we, uh, we hold these webinar series every two weeks. Our next webinar will be Thursday, October 7th. We'll be presenting on tinnitus with Dr. Thanos Zanopoulos and Dr. Philip Perez from our Department of Otolaryngology. So please be on the lookout for that invitation that'll be coming to your email in the next couple weeks. Um, and again, please, we'll be sending out a, a, a survey on this presentation. So please let us know your thoughts uh, and that helps us to improve these presentations going forward. Um, Dr. Swami Nathan and Dr. Deep Dollywall, thank you so much for joining us today and presenting on a topic that is clearly so important to a, a large part of our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a, an absolute pleasure to do this. And especially with Dr. Swami Nathan, what a joy to, um, to present uh, with you as well. And thanks to the INEAR Foundation you guys really uh, have been doing such a fabulous job of, of facilitating research, facilitating uh, discussion, facilitating education, and you're, you're really uh, kind of the unsung heroes of, of today, right? You brought this all together. You brought all of us together with the topic, with the speaker. So thank you um, for doing what you do and really um, expanding the conversation. So. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and thanks to our viewers, really, for supporting us and, and being here and spending time with us today. And thank you for your support of our mission um, as we try to stamp out eye disease. I'll turn it over to Shiva for last comments. Fantastic. That's very well put, uh, Dr. Dhaliwal. And I echo all the feelings, all the statements that you made just now. Uh, so thank you so much for a fantastic team at uh, INR uh, Foundation of Pittsburgh. And uh, thanks to all the donors, you know, uh, you make our uh, work possible. So uh, we are here in part because of your support. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for that, Shiva. And again, if anybody would like to have more information about donating to the foundation, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and with that, we'll let you get back to the rest of your day. So we, we hope, thank you again and hope everybody has a great afternoon.